Well, many of you know that we have been going through a series over the last many weeks entitled Local Impact. And we've been using this series as a push towards our Church in the Streets Day of Service, which is coming up next Sunday here at Westgate. We're super excited about that. But in this series, uh, kind of the purpose behind why we did this is one, as we have mentioned, we wanted to connect with some of the long-term partners that we have had at Westgate Chapel in our community. Uh, We had the Pregnancy Center come in and we spent time talking talking with them, uh, Pat Cannon in that neighborhood church. Uh, we had Sean and Maggie George from Crew. We had a, a friend of ours from Global Opportunities come in and share about the work that is going on in the international community here uh, in, our, in our community. And it has been awesome to hear updates of what God is doing and how God is moving through his people and changing lives in our community. But the other big reason that we have done this series entitled Local Impact as we push towards church in the streets is we really as a church want all of us to take a step back and to take a moment and consider as an individual, how is it that God desires to shape me as his instrument to go into my community and into the world and into my neighborhoods and into my workplace or into my schools and to be a light in the name of Jesus. And over the last many weeks, we've been asking that question, how is it that God desires to shape us? And as we kind of bring it all into a a conclusion and a summation this morning, I want us to take a look again quickly at those different ways that we've talked about that God desires to shape us. If you have your sermon notes, I'd encourage you to pull them out, follow along. There's some fill in the blanks that are there and space to take notes as God is speaking to you this morning. But we talked about how God desires to shape us. In the first week, we talked about the fact that God desires for us as his followers to lead with love. And we looked at the account of the woman who was caught in adultery and What a powerful passage. This woman who's caught in adultery, she is caught in the act, she is guilty. The law says that she should be stoned and killed and the religious leaders drag her in front of Jesus and as they do, their desire is to catch Jesus and really to try to get him to that place of stoning this woman because of her guilt and her shame. And as we looked at this passage together and we talk about how Jesus' response was this beautiful picture of how we are called to lead with love with people who do not know him, people who are sinners, just like us. One of the key things that we talked about was this question. Does how we respond to sinners, sinners, build walls that hinder the gospel Or does how we respond to sinners build bridges that provide a way for the gospel to be heard? As we look at how Jesus himself responded in this passage of scripture, we see that he consistently with people who did not know him led with love, no matter who they were, no matter what their sin was, no matter how far from God they were, he led with love because it built bridges for people to hear and to accept the gospel. And just this past week, as I was preparing this message just two days ago is I was thinking about this point in my study. I was reading on the news and I typically in the news will go back and forth between Fox News, CNN, all these different sites. But on CNN, I saw this article that popped up about this pastor in Tennessee. Does anybody know what I'm going to talk about? Pastor in Tennessee. I see a couple of hands. I'm reading this article about this pastor in Tennessee this past week who preached a sermon at his church last Sunday. It was posted on the internet and he basically says this. He, he calls out people in the LGBTQ community and specifically said that all of them should be rounded up and executed. He said this from the pulpit. His exact words, if you read this article, were that they were worthy of death. And I thought to myself, how in the world have words like that entered into God's church when we look and see how it is that Jesus modeled that we should love other people, especially those that don't know him? As I read these words, my heart was broken for people that are in the church that receive this kind of teaching. The thing that I wanted to say was simply, the last time I checked, you as well are worthy of death, sir. All of us are worthy of death. Because of our sin, we are separated from God and desperately in need of a savior. Church, 
God has called us to lead with love because all of us have been in the position of being separated from God. And unless, but by the grace of God, we receive salvation, we all will face certain death. Praise God that he loved us so much that he did not treat us that way. How then should we treat others. We said that the way that God desires to shape us as we move into our communities and workplaces and seek to teach people about Jesus and to reach out to them is that he desires for us to lead with his love. Number two, we talked about the second week about seeing the unseen and Pastor Pat Cannon came and shared with us not only about his ministry, but challenged us with how it is so easy to get caught up in our own lives and in our own busyness to the place that we don't see the people that God is placing around us every single day. It could be the homeless person on the street. It could be the person that we run into in an Uber or we run into on an airplane. It could be a random person that we have no previous life uh, experience with. And God, do you, we're praying, God, are you, will you open up our eyes to see those that are often unseen because we are too consumed with ourselves? And yet the point, the truth is, is that we also oftentimes don't see people as we are caught up that are right around us every single day that we do have a relationship with. People in our families, people in our workplace, people in our schools, people in our neighborhoods, the parents that we sit at, long games and practices of soccer and baseball and you name the sport. And we don't see the opportunity that God is giving us every day to share with people his love. Pat challenged us with the truth that God desires to shape us by seeing the unseen and challenged us with the question, who are the unseen people in your life that God wants you to take advantage of the opportunities he is placing around you to be a light? So God wants to shape us in leading with love and seeing the unseen. In our third week, we talked about being prepared to give an answer. And in that message, I talked about the fact that statistics from the Barna Research Group show that only 19% of Christians proactively look for opportunities to share their faith. That is a horrifying statistic when you consider that Jesus' last words to his followers were to go and to make disciples. How can we as a church ignore the call that Jesus has placed Based on our life. Another statistic that Barna showed was that 47% of millennials, ages 20 to 34, that are practicing Christians believe that it is actually wrong to share your own personal beliefs with someone and hope that they will one day share that same faith. This is a growing trend in our culture that says it's okay to believe what I believe, but I shouldn't in any way attempt to put that on somebody else. And yet what we read in God's word is something starkly different. God's word tells us that we need to be prepared to give an answer. And most importantly, we talked about as a church the fact that we need to know how to share our faith. We need to know and understand what it is that we believe, why we believe it, and be able to articulate that. And that means that we need to prepare, not only to prepare by knowing God's word, but God has also given each of us as his followers a testimony to share of how he has impacted our life and changed our lives. And that is powerful to a world that wants to know why this is so important. And so we must be those who prepare but it begins with, as we said in that message, if we are going to make sharing Christ with others a priority in our life and be shaped in this way, then God must be our whole life. He must be the most important person and thing to us. And we said that it's not about saying that God is first among all the priorities of our life as though he is one among many to be shuffled around. But the point is, is that as followers of Jesus, God is the most important person and from him, he provides the priorities and things that are important for us in our life. God alone and his priorities guide us. When we understand that truth, we will be shaped into the people that God desires for us to be who will go out and be prepared and look to give an answer to a world that needs to know. God desires to shape us and that we would lead with love, that we would see the unseen, that we would be prepared to give an answer. And last week, number four, we talked about 
uh, mercy that knows no limits. And as we did so, God desires to develop in, within us the mercy of his son that knows no limits. We talked about the parable of the good Samaritan and what did the good neighbor do? We saw that as the, the Samaritan man in the story, that as he sees this person in need, it says that he saw the man's need, that he got down and he got his hands dirty. He was inconvenienced and taken away from what he was uh, in the process of doing. He took time to befriend the man. He gave generously of his own resources to care for him. He came back at a later time to check and make sure everything was taken care of. And all of this to a person that was his sworn enemy. He did not allow fear or hatred or racial or cultural differences to get in the way of who he would show mercy to. And this is the call that Jesus places on our lives is to be agents of his mercy. Mercy that knows no limits and no boundaries that we would share them with all. And we ask this all important question, what would happen if we just quit coming to church and going through the motions and actually started being the church that God designed for us to be. Consider the impact that could happen in our communities if we enveloped these characteristics. And this morning, as we come to our text, I want us to really take a look at how each of these four things we've talked about over the past many weeks really come together in a whole around this one way that I believe God desires to shape each of us. And number five is this, is that God desires for us to embrace the heart of a servant. As we think about loving, leading with with love, and we think about seeing the unseen and being prepared to give an answer and showing mercy that knows no limits. Really, what we have is a picture of a heart of a servant, the servanthood that Christ desires for us to live out in our lives. And I thought no better way to do that this morning than to go directly to a text that paints this picture so clearly by using Jesus as our primary example. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter two this morning, I'm gonna have us take a look and um, I'm not sure if we fixed it on the screen or not, but we're gonna take a look at verses one through 11. Originally, I told them just five through eight, but I'm gonna go through the whole context together this morning. And I would like for us to inspect the servanthood of Jesus that is described in this passage. You see, as Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi, he's writing to a church that has been going through uh, major persecution and that at times has even struggled with being unified together. And so in order to strengthen their own unity, he calls them to serve one another. And you will see that in this passage and to display the servanthood of Jesus. And so look at this passage with me found here in Philippians chapter two, verses one through 11. Here's what it says. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God had high, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Amen. As we look at this passage, we have this beautiful picture of the servanthood of Jesus and how he lived out his life. And I want us to, as we talk about embracing the heart of a servant, I want us to look at the example that he has given us and that Paul paints for us here in this passage. As we begin in verse six, it says to us here, 
or it says in beginning verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Number one, Jesus did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. I want you to think about the significance of, of that statement. To me, it is one of the most impressive things about who Jesus was. It says he was in the form of God. The Greek word for form here refers to the outward manifestation of an inward reality. The idea is that before the incarnation, before Jesus became a man from all eternity past, Jesus preexisted in the divine form of God, equal with God the Father in every way. Jesus was fully divine. We see this all throughout scripture. In Colossians 1.15, Paul speaking to the church says, he being Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In John 1.1, 1, 1, speaking of Jesus, we see that it also says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We see in John 8.58, as Jesus is speaking of himself, he says, truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am making that declaration that he himself is God. Hebrews chapter one, we see that the writer says that he being Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. The most impressive thing to me that I read here is that Jesus being God did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. It wasn't something for him to hold on to. As I thought of that, I had this picture in my mind of myself as a child with my sister sitting in the room after Christmas where we had gotten presents and she wanted to play with this truck that I had gotten and I remember sitting there going, don't touch my toys and grabbing it because it's mine and I wanna keep it. And we got in this like shoving match and pulling back and forth, trying to hold on to and grasp what was mine. It's funny, I see that in my own kids still today happening every single Christmas. Give me that, no, I wanna hold on to what is mine. And yet even as adults, when we think about the things that we love and that we want and that we want to hold on to, the things that are most valuable and important to us, maybe it has to do with our, things that have to do with our identity or our status or our job or this or that or something else. We have at times with things that we desire and want to keep, we get iron fisted claws and we hold on to things because we don't want to release them because they are valuable, important to us. Imagine then with things that seem so trivial that Jesus being equal with God did not consider that equality with God something to be held on to. In Mark chapter nine, as the disciples are fighting over who would be the greatest, he gives them this instruction and he says to them as they, as they fight back and forth that the greatest will be the person who is the servant of all. And what Jesus exemplifies for us in scripture and we see here in this passage is that servanthood is a call to let recognition go. The point that I want to make is that servants are not status seekers. And this goes against everything that our culture teaches us today. Everything in our culture today points us towards seeking greater status. All you have to do is grab your phone and go through your social media account on Facebook, and if you have one, and scroll through and look and see how people post about themselves on a consistent basis, taking selfies and pictures and posting it up. And, you know, and I have not been uh, uh, not guilty of this in the past. And you look at that and you think to yourself, I mean, even some people, I'm telling you, still, if you do this, I'm really not trying to point you out, I promise to you, but people that will stand in a bathroom mirror to take a picture of themselves and post it on Facebook, and I think to myself, what has our culture done to us? I don't want to see a picture of you in the place where you're taking care of your business, and no, <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to see that, but our culture drives us to this narcissistic place where we want to make people think that we are important, that there is something great, to see the best sides of us. We live in a very selfie, self-driven culture that breeds narcissism, where we have a drive to be known, a drive to be popular, or to be an important voice in the world around us. We're driven by success. We're driven by having a name. And this affects our churches. There are churches that are driven by being the most popular, that have the most people. It's a thing that, you know, they're driven by. Pastors fall into this because they want to have a name and be an important voice. People in our churches, Christians all the time, fall into wanting recognition for their good works. 
The point that Jesus makes for us when he does not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped is that servanthood means that we aren't seeking to make a name for ourselves. Servanthood means that we care more about others and we care more about God's glory than we do ourselves. And is this how we are being shaped as his followers? So Jesus did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Number two, we see as well, Sorry, my notes are out of order here. We see that number two, Jesus also made himself nothing. And John MacArthur uh, talks about this point where the passage tells us Jesus made himself nothing. And he says that Jesus emptied himself completely of every vestige of advantage and privilege, refusing to assert any divine right on his own behalf. He who created and owned everything forsook everything. Think about the depth of what it means that Jesus made himself nothing. Jesus, the creator of the world, who was, who was there in the process of creation, the one who formed the world, the one who separated light and darkness, the one who separated the waters and the land, the one who filled the waters with, with living creatures, who filled the land with other creatures, the one who created all of the plants and everything we see, when he created all of us as people and look at the beauty and the intricacy of how he created us, of how how, how much detail is put in. Walk through nature and think to yourself, look at the beauty of what he did and ask yourself this question. How in the world could the creator of the world with all the power equal with God, the owner of heaven in all of its glory and perfection with no tears and no sadness and no brokenness and no pain and no hurt, give it all up. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus made himself nothing. He gave it all up the glory of heaven to come to a broken world, equality with God to take on a broken human body, the power to create and to control to a limited human existence. Jesus chose servanthood and he chose humility. And the point that we get from this, I believe, is that servants are intentionally to pursue humility. Servanthood is a call to empty ourselves of anything that would hinder our obedience and service to the Lord. You see, humility recognizes in our own lives who God is, but also who I am in relation to God. It recognizes that God is in control of all things, that God himself is holy and set apart. It recognizes that I am a sinner that rebelled against God and that is deserving of punishment and death. But God in his grace has loved me so much that he has provided a way for me to be restored in relationship with God. Humility recognizes who God is, who I am in relation to God, a sinner in need of grace, but also who I am in relation to other people, that I am no better than anyone else, that we are all sinners desperately in need of the grace of God. And I love how Paul explains this to the church in verses three through four of Philippians two, when he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What he's telling us to do is to level the playing field and to pursue humility like Christ did as servants of the king. Number three, it tells us that Jesus took on the very nature of a servant. And what's beautiful about this is it wasn't just some sort of charade that Jesus put on, it was the real deal. When we think about this idea of, uh, of a servant that is listed here in Philippians chapter two, it carries the idea of a bond servant. A bond servant in that day owned nothing. They didn't even own the clothes on their back. Everything that they had, including their life, belonged to their master. And what we read about Jesus in scripture is that Jesus owned nothing. He owned no land, he owned no house, he had no gold, no jewels, he had no business, no boat, no horse. He had absolutely nothing. He even had to borrow his grave at his death. He also, though, as we see, not only did he come into this world with nothing as a servant, a bond servant, but he came for the purpose of serving, serving others for God's glory. And all throughout scripture, we read about how Jesus heals the sick, the lepers, the blind, the lame, the bleeding woman. The, he raises the dead to life. We see how Jesus serves others in the way that he loved those that society and the religious world at that time said were unlovable people. The tax collector, the prostitute, the adulterer, the greatest of sinners. And he even served 
served his disciples. Those who in the societal structure of rabbi and disciple where the rabbi is supposed to be at the top and the disciples follow, he served his disciples. We see in scriptures, he gets down and he washes their feet, which for them was something that was almost horrifying for them to experience. But I think even more uh, pressing when you read that passage is the fact that not only does he wash his disciples' feet, but on the night before he is going to go to his death, he gets down and he washes the feet of the disciple that was going to betray him and lead him to his death. Showing the incredible servanthood that God himself had placed on Jesus' life as he came into this world, the way that he would love those who were the unlovable. Jesus laid down his life. And the point is this, is that servants don't just act the part, they are servants through and through to the very core of their being. Being a servant isn't about doing. Being a servant is about being about being changed and transformed in our hearts. It isn't about doing a good deed. It's about living a life that is focused on other people. It isn't about serving because you have to or because you feel guilted, but because you recognize the call God has placed on your life to impact the lives of others. And nothing brings you greater satisfaction and joy than being a part of God's kingdom work in this world. I remember that when I was uh, in my first youth pastoring job, I've shared a part of the story with you before, but I, uh, I remember that my, my lead pastor came to me and asked me to participate in this outreach basketball league that our church was doing. I did not want to do it. I had far better things in my mind that I needed to be doing with my time, but he kind of forced me into it saying, Rob, I need you as the, the other pastor in our church and other Christian leaders and our elders to be a part of this so that we can reach out to these non-believers that are come to this league. And I begrudgingly agreed because I had to, and it was my first job and I wanted to be that good guy, but I was actually really upset about it. I didn't like the idea of doing this. I didn't want to do it at all, but I showed up the first night and my team that I got what I would have said at that time stuck with, uh, only five of us showed up that night, which meant this out of shape guy had to run the court the entire time. Did not make me happy. But I remember halfway through the game because of my competitive nature, there was a play that happened at half court where I stole the ball in mid pass, started driving to the basket. There was a guy about twice my size, but between me and the basket, I tried to do my Kobe Bryant juke move and went around him and he hip checked me in the air and I fell and I landed and tore my ACL on the spot. Painful experience. And let me tell you, if I was ever more angry about being in this league when I didn't want to, it was at that exact moment. And when my boss came to help me up, I looked at him I'm like, this is your fault. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I came back week after week to be the glorified coach of my team. And God did a changing work in my heart. What began as something I had to do, I began to realize that God was giving me the opportunity to speak into these men's lives who were coming from broken marriages, broken families who were dealing with addiction and who desperately needed people that would care and just simply talk to them. And he opened the door for me to make an impact in the lives of other people. At the end of this thing, I had to go back to my boss and apologize to him not because he had really, I had hidden a lot of my feelings away from him about what was going on, but I went to apologize because I sat there and went, man, my attitude was so poor. I was serving because I had to. Not because I recognized that God had something incredible he wanted to do through my life that he had gifted me with. And trust me, it wasn't gifting me with the skills of basketball. It was gifting me with the ability to care about people and to love them and to walk with them. And my friends, I want you to understand this point. There are so many opportunities for us to serve people on a daily basis, working in children's ministry in the church or working with the youth ministry, teaching them about who Jesus is so that they one day would have that same faith we do, serving in guest services in our church to be that shining bright face as people walk in the doors and feel welcome into our church family, to go to church in the streets this next week and serve in our community so that other people would know Jesus to serve at the fall festival, the pumpkin patch, or many other outreaches that we do. But I want you to know something. I know that you at times say, like I have in the past, things like, ah, they're just looking for another person. Ah, they're just always looking for more people. And we get in our hearts this thing that goes, I'm tired of serving, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna be the one. But I want you to understand this truth. When the church says we need people to serve, we aren't asking people to be a warm body or to babysit. 
We're asking people to take up the giftedness that God has given them to join God in the work that he is doing in other people's lives because that is how God created his church to be. These are opportunities to be used by God and this should be the most exciting thing in our lives. And I want to challenge us as a church to understand that servants don't just act the part. They are servants through and through because of the joy of serving the king. Point number four, Jesus, it says in this passage, was made in human likeness. And one of my favorite passages in scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16, which describes this truth for us. And this is what it says. It says, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. One of the most beautiful things about Jesus being made in human likeness is that Jesus can fully identify with me in the struggle that I face living in this broken world. Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses and our struggle with sin. He understands because he became one of us. And the point I want us to understand that we learn from Jesus' example is that servants identify with those that they serve. We don't place ourselves on a pedestal as somehow we are stooping down to help others or we are better than other people, but servanthood calls us to come and to walk alongside people, to level the playing field, to come with them in their brokenness so that we could be used by God in their lives for his glory. I remember that when I was in high school, I had a youth leader who did this for me, Charlie Lundstrom. He was this guy that played basketball for Purdue. He sat the bench a lot, but he played basketball for Purdue. He was 6'8". Uh, he, was, he was a phenomenal guy to be around, but he had a crazy busy job. Uh, at the time, he was single and occasionally dating, but he was one of our youth leaders. But here's a guy whose life was busy that took time to invest in me as a youth leader when I was just this runt causing trouble in the church, but also struggling with self-esteem. I didn't have friends. I hated everything about my life. And this guy poured into me constantly. After spending two hours with me at youth group, he would often and drive me home at nine o'clock at night. And rather than going home after being busy on a tired, long day, he would often sit in my driveway until 11 or 11.30 at night, asking me about my life, walking with me in the things that I was struggling with, helping to carry the pain and the burden that I carried and giving me confidence to know that God loved me. He was willing to walk with me. And as I look back, I can't remember one iota of one significant phrase that he said to me. But I can tell you this, he walked with me and he cared and he served me in a way that God used to change and transform my life forever. And this is what Jesus has modeled for us as he came and was made in human likeness. He identifies with us and he calls us as servants to identify with those that we serve by walking with them and identifying with them in their own struggle. Finally, Number five, Jesus humbled himself to the point of death. And it was a horrific death at the hands of his own creation. And yet God's word tells us that he went willingly. Matthew 26 says, if it is possible, that Jesus said, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but God, not my will, but yours be done. He humbled himself to the place of pouring out everything. And the point I want to draw from this is that servants sometimes do things that they don't want to do for the sake of being Jesus to other people. When we read in verses nine and 10, we see the beauty of this, this type of servanthood through Jesus's life. In, in, in verses nine through 10 of chapter two of Philippians, it says this, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This picture of Jesus' servanthood was so as Jesus came into the world that people would know the depth of God's love for them. As Paul is writing this to the church in Philippi as they have been struggling with suffering, as they've been struggling with their own unity, he tells them that this type of servanthood of modeling our lives after Jesus is the thing that will bring unity within our bodies, but also 
that will be a powerful testimony to this world as it looks at us and sees how we serve each other and how we serve others. It will be a powerful testimony to the world of who Jesus Christ is and from that they can know him personally. So my friends, I share with you this morning, as we as Westgate Chapel, individuals who call this church our home, as we feel this call to go out and make an impact in our community, not just on Church in the Streets Day of Service, which is next week, but every day of our lives. He is calling us and shaping us to be those who would lead with love, to be those who would see the unseen, who would be prepared to give an answer, to be those who would get, show mercy that knows no limits, but most importantly, all encompassing, that we would embrace the heart of a servant with Jesus as our model of how we serve others. And as we do so, we will become the vessels that he has desired for us to be that he can use in his strength and in the power of the Holy Spirit to transform the lives of others. Church, will you be that servant? Let's pray. God, I give you thanks again. Thank you for providing for us the opportunity week in and week out to come here to this place, this church, where we can fellowship with one another, but God, most importantly, where we can come and worship you. Not just sing songs, not just hear a message and go out and feel good, but God, worship you. Ascribe value and worth to your name and yield our hearts and our lives to you. As we worship you this morning and as we've been talking about over these past many weeks, our desire is to be transformed by you, God. That as we seek to make an impact in our community, in our neighborhoods, in the world that surrounds us. We want to be shaped by the things that are most important to you as God, we reach out to this world. And we look, God, to your son, Jesus Christ, and his model and example that he laid out for us in the way that he led with love and loved those that the world and even the religious leaders deemed unworthy of love. We look to his example of how he constantly saw those who were the unseen of society, of the challenge and the call to be prepared to give an answer because of what you have done in our lives. We see his example of showing mercy that knew no limits and all of that combined, God. We recognize that Jesus was the greatest servant. And so God, would you transform our hearts to be that type of servant? that your name would be made great in this world and that people would know you. We love you, God. Do this work in us as individuals and as a product in our church as a whole. In Jesus' name, amen.